So hello and welcome back and this time I just want to give you a quick overview of the C programming language. So first of all we can create a simple C program in Envim and let's write our first hello world uh, program and I will just explain everything as I go. So the include statement just includes a file which is stdio.h which is um, for input and output operations. And the include statement basically just copy pastes the entire file into here. So we can use everything that's in that file, which we can see here. This is the stdio file, which is in a compiler include directory. And it defines a whole lot of stuff for us that we can use uh, now in our program. Then the C pro pr program always starts at a function, which is called main to execute. And from here on, operating system basically calls this function and then every line will be executed line by line. So to do hello world, we can now use our puts uh, function that is um, defined in this header here. Let's go to that header again and let's search for puts. And there we have it, f puts, and here is the puts function signature at least and you can also read what it does here but it simply just puts something on the screen so let's write the world like this we can also specify an ex additional new line but we don't have to puts uh, already does that for us and as we can see um, the main function is an int function so it expects um, an integer to be returned and we can do that um, with the return statement where um, zero would be an indication to the operating system that the program has exited successfully and everything else would be an error code. And we can then use any compiler that we want. We could either use Clang or GCC for example, to compile uh, our file now, which would be main, and the, our output would be then either an object file or we can compile it into straight uh, into uh, an ELF program straight away because GCC can also link everything for us. And if we now put in file main dot elf we can see we have a um, elf executable file so let's execute it and as we can see hello world gets printed to a screen so that is our first program ever <laughs> so i'm doing this uh, a little bit out of my head so I think we will move on with comments because these are also useful to have before we dive into anything deeper. Um, we can write comments in the code that won't be executed uh, by the computer with um, double slashes and then uh, the whole line after it will be a comment as we can see here in our editor. Uh, it is grayed out and won't be executed but any additional new line without any slash will uh, be executed again. So for example, we can annotate here that puts prints some text to a screen, for example. And we can also annotate this line as you can see, it doesn't have to be at the beginning of the line, but the rest of the line will be a comment then. There are double slashes. So we can say main is the entry point for our program. Of course, those um, comments don't make too much of too much sense right now. These are just um, showing how comments work. But also there are um, multi-line comments which you can also start with a slash but then a star 
and you can end them with a star and a slash. Everything between those two will then be a comment. We can, for example, write some information about the program here. So we can write, this is just a simple tutorial program, for example. And finish this off. And we can also write who the author is of this program, which would be me. And this is how multi-line comments work. And that's basically already it for comments. Now we can also uh, maybe uh, start to introduce variables. And I will just get rid of these comments right here because they are not too helpful. <laughs> We can also use uh, the printf function to print text to the screen. And what printf does is it first gets a format and afterwards um, we specify what we want to input. So I leave this blank for now. I just want to show you how variables work. Um, variables basically have a type and there are multiple types. Um, I will show um, these types later. Um, one of the most basic type is an integer type, which is basically for integers. So we just call this number and assign it to some value. And we can then use this number here, for example, as an argument to printf, which reads um, this this format right here, the number was, is, and then that. And printf, we have to specify a new line character. And basically, as you can see here, we have uh, a format uh, and in the beginning, which has these placeholders that get pulled in from the right, right here, from the arguments. And a placeholder um, always starts with the percentage and then uh, the type of, of the placeholder where D is for a whole number uh, or for an integer number. But we could also have a floating point number, which is a number with a floating point position. Let's just call it FL. And well, let's just call it pi. Right, approximately that. <laughs> and we could also use that here. And pi is f for floating point. And then we could um, input pi here, like that. Why is it complaining here? Oh, it's not I, so right. And if you run that, let's let's put all of these commands into one thing. So we can run it with one command. And as we can see, a uh, number is five and pi is that. So as you can see, um outputted more numbers that we have specified, more decimal places. And we can also um, do that. Um, we can also specify a position where we can specify a dot and then how many how many numbers we want to have after the decimal place. So, so as you can see, we only have um, two places uh, after the decimal point as precision now, which is what we wanted. We can, of course, also change the number, what is inside of these variables. So let's mood, uh, yeah, one time is enough. And let's change, for example, our number to uh, reassign our number to 25. And pi might be 99.99. And if you run that, 
we can also forgot to save it again so let's do that again and as we can see it first um, executes the first line and outputs the values as they are when this line executes and then after that line it changes the values and then outputs the new values it's basically really um, like a cooking book recipe and you start in here and then just go line by line down like that right hope that makes sense <laughs> and hope i'm not moving too slowly um, basic data types um, we have in c are integer or a small integer number integer numbers that can be positive and negative there's unsigned or values that have to be un uh, positive uh, yeah and we have to give it a num uh, a name of course um, let's call it just us and unsigned uh, we can also have a long integer number which is just long um, for larger numbers and let's just call it l and we can save large numbers into that maybe we want to have even larger numbers we could have a long long and ll here at the end just means um, treat this as a long long value we could also specify in single l right here and unsigned we could specify and use um, unsigned also does work as more or less like a modifier um, like long does so you can stick long int together and get a long integer which would be the same as long or you could also do unsigned int um, which would be the same as unsigned but the really interesting thing um, might be unsigned long long um, if you need a really big positive number like that um, let's get rid of this size t which is just the type def to unsigned long long Um, size t is um, <clears throat> but uh, always guaranteed to be the size of a pointer so on a 64 uh, bit machine this is guaranteed to be 64 bits in size and in on a 32 bit machine this is guaranteed to be a 32 bit value so of course uh, if we want to have more precision uh, with our floats we could also use a double which has double the precision of a float um, and, a, and a char can store a single character like a for example and these are basically the most important um, basic base types there are a lot of operators that we mathematical operators we can use as number times two for we can assign a new variable to the result of an operation for example but we can also redefine our number based on the output of an operation. Um, there are also shorthand notations for this. When you just write the operation you want to do before the equal sign and then after that you want to specify the right hand side of the operation. So basically this means number equals number times two and there are all of course also other mathematical operations um, like all base operations in math um, you can use plus minus um, divided by and also the modulus operator um, yeah let's stick with multiplication maybe we can um, I can explain the modulus operator because this is um, usually something some people don't know so modulus always gives gives you the 
the leftover of uh, a division, for example. If we define our integer and call it leftover equals number modulus three. Of course, I spelled number wrong. This will take number divided by three and then assigns er anything that is left that cannot be divided by three again into um, the leftover. For example, if number would be, let's say number would be five and we would modulo, modulus uh, three, then three would go into five one time that would be um, the output of the division. And the modulus gives us uh, the thing that can't be divided divided anymore. And what is left over after the division is a leftover of um, two, because, well, one times three equals three plus two equals five. I hope that's something you can follow. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can explain it well, but it's a really easy concept and you will surely get it um, if you play around with it if you don't uh, already get it. An interesting concept in C is, <clears throat> at least in ANSI C, um, which I'm used to writing, is that there is no um, Boolean type. So there's no... Oh, there is now, but in ANSI C, there is no real Boolean type. This m might be just a type def. I'm not sure. I'm not too familiar with the newer standards. Let's test this. So apparently this. Yeah, it does not work. <laughs> I was surprised there for a second, um, but Basically, in older C standards, I'm not sure about the newer ones, but the ones I am familiar with, um, which is basically the ANSI uh, C standard, there are no um, Boolean operators. Uh, there's no Boolean type. So, um, anything other than zero will be... Um, will be treated as um, true and anything zero would be treated as false. So any of these types can be zero. And if they are, um, they are basically um, evaluated as false. And if they are anything else, then they are treated as true. So in basically all program languages, I know there are if statements, if something, then something happens, right? Happens. And there's also an else block that happens um, if the else, um, if the if condition didn't, uh, Hold true. So something here can be just an integer, and this might be, for example, ooh, let's yeah, let's just assign it to one. like that. And we can also test the code again. So if I would save it, of course, I really have to do that. And we can see something happened because anything else than zero gets um, evaluated as true. And let's change it um, to zero now for reference. 
Hello. I just want to I really just want to compile my program again. So let's do it manually this time again. Like that. And we can see nothing happened. And C um, doesn't have a Boolean type, but it does have Boolean operators. So we could test if, let's see, let's say testing equals five. And let's test here if testing is five. So the double equals here um, tests for equality. And if it is equal, then it will return one and if it's not equal, then it will return zero. So let's see. I need to save it again. Now compile it again, and run it, and we can see something happened. Um, we can test if it's equal to six, which should be false again. And as we can see, nothing happened. And we can have um, different Boolean operators here, which would be the double equals for testing equality. And we could have the exclamation uh, equals, which tests if it's not equal to six. So which should be true because it's not equal to six because it's five. Then we have Um, the AND operator, which ANDs to um, Boolean expressions. So we test if this on the left side is true and this on the right side is true. And if both are true, it will uh, evaluate it true. And if it's, so let's say true and at one. <clears throat> so testing is not equal to six, which is true. Let's put here brackets here so we can see it better. And and one, so it's true. But as soon as one of these conditions get false, uh, this whole thing here gets evaluated to false. And there's also the or, so we can have a double pipe symbol right here. And this tests if either the left side or the right side or both are true. So if any um, of these two are true, this whole expression here evaluates to true, right? Uh, true basically meaning one and uh, false meaning uh, zero because there's no uh, boolean type. So uh, let's cover some control structures. Um, as we can see, um, we all we do have if statements and if um, always um, executes the following instruction basically if the condition in here gets evaluated to true and these brackets here, these uh, curly brackets, they basically bundle anything between them into one uh, block or you can think of them as bundling them into one instruction even if that's not uh, correct, but I like to think about it like that. So because we only have one instruction here, we can also leave them off and we can also combine if and else. For example, if this doesn't hold true, then we can, uh, we, we go into here and maybe we only want to go into here if another condition 
um, holds true. So we can specify another if. Else if something else. And then we can all oh, again specify a single instruction after that. Because um, this one is one instruction. After this one, we could, of course, make this more clear. Like this, right? And I'm not really consistent here with my curly brackets. Uh, as we're doing NCC, we should also have the uh, NC way of writing. So let's put it, put them like this. Of course, something else is not defined. Like this. And as you can see, um, if we only have a single instruction after, now we can also get rid of the curly braces brackets. So let's do this here. And same thing here for this if, if uh, block here. Right. A good practice is, is usually to always put them um, for else I, if statements. I usually um, leave them out because uh, it just adds another indentation. But for statements like these that are not control structs, I usually like to put them so it's more clear for the reader um, what happens. Uh, at least I think so. Also, if we add another thing down here, we don't mess it up because if there are no um, brackets and we want to add another thing and we might expect this to be executed also, but it doesn't, uh, well, because conditionally, because, well, the condition only binds to the first statement, of course. So, for example, if we would have it like this, one could think, okay, um, this has the same indentation, this gets executed also conditionally based on this condition, which would be not true. In this case, uh, the else prevents this from happening because um, else needs a prior if statement. But um, I think you see where I'm going here. So I just wanted to show you how it works, but in practice you, I think um, from personal preference, you should really always put braces in here, even if they're annoying to write sometimes. Um, we do also have, you can, you can imagine if we bundle a, a huge chunk of these, um, else and then if and then this if could also again have another else statement then this else could in turn also have an if statement again and you you do commonly have something like this not not too often but it is uh, common enough to have a shorthand <laughs> basically because this can also be um, uh, written shorter uh, basically if you have something else equals equals one, which would be true, or something else would be two, um, like this. Um, struct uh, patterns like this um, often emerge, so there is a short form for that, which is the switch statement. And you can maybe want to switch over values of testing. So you specify testing, And then you write case, and then what value you want to match, zero, case zero. And then you break, and in between is um, 
all the code that gets executed if testing would be zero. You can also um, put more cases into one. Case one, case two, for example. And then basically everything would get executed until it hits break. So let's say puts a low number. But we could also have a high number or a medium number case. Let's say three case four and case five. Oh, let's just, have, yeah, let's do this. Medium number. And everything above is a high number. Puts of course this uh, now would only work for positive numbers because if we would um, put something into testing that would be negative let's say that um, then we would see see that uh, it is a high number, even though it is a negative number. So to fix this, we can also do an unsigned number. And now it would be a high number. As you can see, it's, it's still a high number, but, 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 but. it might not have the value that you expect it to have. High number. And then let's output the number. U is for unsigned. And as you can see, it's a really high number. <laughs> I also forget forgot to put a new line, so we have some artifacts there in the console. So let's do that again. Um, hello. What did I do here? Clear. I just want to run main. Okay, so. Um, as we can see, we have a really high number. And what happens internally is that we save the minus 5 here into um, the space um, that is reserved for the testing variable, which is uh, 4 bytes, so it's, it fits uh, right into there. But it gets inter interpreted as an unsigned value and not as assigned value so um, it basically treats uh, the, the negative representation as a positive number and uh, because of the tooth complement that ends up to be a really large number um, we can do uh, go into the tooth complement uh, maybe in another another video um, I think that would be too long for now but it basic it is really simple. Uh, you can also look it up in YouTube. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot uh, about the topic. We also have loops. Maybe let's start with a while loop because they're often easier to understand, I think. And we could have testing again. So while is basically an if statement 
that always n returns to itself again until the condition in here is false, basically uh, meaning null, basically meaning uh, zero. I mean, so let's set testing to back to five again, and we could, for example, subtract one from testing. This is a shorthand notation for subtracting one um, from testing and assigning it to testing. And then it would iterate um, over this uh, five times because, well, testing is five. So it would go in with five, then it would be four, three, two, and so on until it has hit zero. And we could have this. Testing is bigger than zero. Um, yeah, basically like that. Um, we could also have a print f to have the value also printed out. I think that's better. Testing is and we have it as an unsigned value, so we specify u here, and then switch to put a testing like this. Let's save it again, and then compile it and test the code again. And as we can see, first it goes in with five, then four, three, two, one, then the value zero, and when we have zero it um it goes into here and checks hey is testing anything else than zero and it says no and then we continue here so while this condition here is true it executes this code and jumps back execute jump back execute jump back and always tests um, this condition before it goes into this block uh, each iteration. Then there's also the do while, which is very similar. It starts with do and then while testing and what this does is um, the first um, iteration it doesn't check if it should go in or not it just goes in and then tests if it should go in another time so yeah we can take a look at how this would look like And it basically does the same thing, but there's one minor difference, meaning if we would put this to zero, then it would still go into the code one time where the normal while wouldn't. Um, yeah. Of course, that is a bug. <laughs> and what happened here is uh, we go in with zero and we set testing to something else than zero and then it just goes infinitely. So we have to remove this line. And as you can see, it also goes in with zero as a value. And then we come to my favorite loop, uh, which is the for loop. For, then we can specify a variable declaration, for example, x. Usually we should call it i to be, um, yeah, more, more conformant, <laughs> I'd say and we can assign a value to it. Then we can have our condition that we want to check. Mm. 
which would be if i is smaller than 500, for example, then we would iterate over this 500 times. And then we have um, our expression that we want to execute after each uh, loop iteration. So this time plus plus i to go over it uh, 500 times. Or we could also make it i uh, multiplied by i, so it doesn't uh, go into it that often. But of course, we would multiply with zero, so it would always stay zero. So let's do it with two instead and then we could um print f well you of i which is an integer so we'll specify d as the template or you know as a placeholder i don't i never know how to call them <laughs> like this and of course we want to specify an n and let's go again and as we can see we get our stuff maybe we could go with multiplied by two and have this as start by one. And yeah, we get these numbers. Cool. So um, to iterate over this again, um, we start by defining our, when we come from here, we start here and define our new variable and set it equal to one. This will only execute one time. This one will execute before every loop, which is basically the condition in the while block um, for the while loop. So it always checks if this condition is still true and then enters this block here. And after each loop, when basically, when we have executed all of this, it does this. And then we go back to here, check if the condition is true, enter it again, right? Loops also have some other control statements for them. Let's do another while loop. While testing. And we could check here if testing is smaller than zero. And if testing is smaller than zero, then we could break, for example. We know the break keyword from our st uh, switch um, statement thing here. Break um, basically just jumps out of the surrounding control block, basically, and executes um, continuous execution after it. So this is what we want to do here. Um, basically, if it is a negative value, then we just want to continue and don't want to do anything. Also, we want uh, we can skip executions. Um, for example, if testing modulus two. So you can imagine uh, if we put in two here, it gets divided by two and nothing is left. So this will be evaluated to false, not divisible by two, then we continue, but we jump right back into here and never modify testing. So we need to put it um, here. So testing gets modified before we continue. 
testing is an unsigned value and unsigned never can be smaller than zero. So let's convert it to an int. For uneven values we skip and for for even values is it's false and we put now we go into here. So we need to change that. So let's go again and yeah. That looks right. So let's go again and yeah. That looks right. Also another thing I want to show you is how arrays work in C. And basically what an array is, is just more or less a fixed sized list of um, things where you specify the type uh, at the beginning and let's call this numbers. And then we can either um, specify the size right here or we can also have the numbers just in here that and then we can index into our numbers like this um, example int num because number we have already and then we can say this would be two because um, the index starts at zero so this would be the first number if we would like to have the second number which would be four then we would do it like this and yeah there is I think that's there's not too much to it but just for um, let's say we don't know which values we want to uh, add into here maybe we just want to have uh, we want to allocate um, space on the heap uh, on the stack for a lot of numbers then we could also um, specify a size here let's say we want to allocate space for 255 uh, numbers on the stack and then assign these numbers later and we could do for int i equals zero e smaller than i smaller than 255 plus 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 i that Hello, I can't type that word there. And then we could use i to index into our array and assign it to something. And of course we need to use numbers because number is just a simple single number like that. And with that we would iterate over our uh, numbers array and feed um, yeah and initialize it with some number that we calculate right here there's one other thing we can do and with that we can go into strings because there's no real string type in C um, we instead use character arrays let's say we would like to do something like this and this would be a string this is a array of characters and in C there is a shorthand notation for creating character arrays um, this would create a, an array for us um, and also it would implicitly specify the null terminator at the end so we can leave this off and we can use the s placeholder here and now feed our string into here this would already work and as we can see um, there's our hello world at the end let's actually try something string of one Let's change that into an A. And uh, let's do that after this line. And also specify a new line character here. 
we should see. And as you can see, we have Hello World there now, not Hello World. Yep. We write it like this though. And there's only a slight difference between a pointer type and an array. Um, for example, an array does have a length. Um, a pointer doesn't have a length. But if we start to introduce pointers now, what exactly is a pointer? Well, a pointer is just uh, an address stored in a variable. So this point, uh, this star here just annotates that this variable here stores the address of a character, which would be this character here. And since we know strings are null terminated, we can iterate over this from the start address until we hit our null terminator here at the end. We can also create an address of an address and we can get the address of a variable that we've already specified like this and this will tell us where this variable is stored and this variable uh, tells us where this string is stored or where this h is stored and we can chain things together like that um, you could have a small example let's create another section here for pointers because I think it takes some time to get used to let's say we want to create a variable called a and that is a normal stack variable and we can also um, store its address let's say in an int pointer called b and that is just the address of a so now we have the address of a saved in b and a has the value of five so we can now dereference the address which means we can look up where this address is um, or what kind of address is saved as a, uh, in, in b and then assign it to something let's say we assign it to six then if we would print it out, and as we can see, um, we now get the address, uh, we now get six and not five anymore. So we can see B and A have access to the same value here, because through B we can access A and through A we can access the value. So B stores the value, uh, the address of a and then we can modify what lives at that address like this right here where the star here in front means just look this address up and then change the value address address to um, this value here we can also have another pointer point oh man pointer pointer c and that stores the address of b do we have c defined somewhere yes we did let's change it to pp like this and then what we could do is Look the address up of the address that gets looked up from pp and then change it to 8 and now we should
get eight out if we would save it of course like this as you can see we now have eight here and really um, pointers are not that complicated um, they just get some they just take some time to get used to for some people i guess but all they really are is just a regular variable that stores an address that has some special functionality to look up that address and to modify the value added address but there's nothing too special about them really what we have done now um, is basically we've always written in a very ser serialized manner so we we go from here to here to here to here to here to here to here and as you can imagine that gets quite lengthy if we would continue to do that so what i want to introduce you now to is functions and for that we can specify a function here let's say just add that would add two numbers together and this is now um, how a function would look like uh, first of all we have the return type the type that gets returned by the function you can imagine a function like a mathematical function it takes an in x and then calculates something and returns that and in this where, uh, case it would take an x and y and then do something and return the result so we can return something with our return keyword and in this case we would just return a plus b then after that we would have the name of our function we can specify any name we want here and then here we have our function body inside these curly braces where we can do any calculation we might do in the function or any functionality we want to do in the function and then what is really important in C in some languages we can specify the function after we use it but C goes always from the top down in a file so we need to copy the sec signature and then promise the compiler that we are going to implement this function so we just um, add the function signature here at the top and this is what he where header files also come in um, as we've said um, at the very beginning header files um, just get copy and pasted um, so all the as you can see we have here a lot of definition uh, a lot of declarations but there's no body to the function because the functionality gets implemented somewhere else and then gets linked into the binary later by the linker this is basically just a promise that the functionality will be there and everything inside of here will get copied and pasted where we have this include statement this basically just means select everything in this file and paste it here <clears throat> right now i want to keep it simple so i have just added um, the declaration just like that um, this is also called a prototype a function prototype and with that we can now use it
like this. And to verify our result, we can also use printf again. And of course, we have to save it again. And as we can see, the result is 66. And this we can use to clean up our code in the future or break up our code in the future into functions. Then we wouldn't have all this in one single um, string, more or less one single scope we could break it up into functions and uh, a good thing about functions is that we can also reuse them so we could um, call this function again and don't have to copy paste anything we can just use it again and yeah also if we would have done anything wrong in our function we just we can just modify it in one place and then it gets um yeah we don't need to modify it here or anything also what we can do is to call our function ourselves in our function that would be recursion for example, we could call ourselves here, um, add a and b, but we would also have to build in some functionality to exit if a is smaller than zero, then Turn one like this. Now we would go in and see if um, if a is yeah if a is smaller than a zero. If it's bigger than zero, then we subtract uh, subtract one from it. Then we call add again, and yeah, and then we are here again, do the same thing until a is smaller than zero. If it's smaller than zero, then we return one, and then we would um, continue here with a being um, something smaller than one uh smaller than zero so it should be minus one and then we sub subtract b from it and get our result this shouldn't be called add anymore but yeah you get the point then one last thing i wanted to mention is structs um, as we have seen, we have specified a lot of um, variables at the top here, but maybe we want to have our own type, maybe player, like this, for example, and this would be player one. But as we can see, we don't have a player. And to define uh, our custom types, we can write uh, the struct keyword, then how we want to name our type. Then come the curly braces. 
um, with a semicolon here at the end. And then we can write any attributes that uh, a player might have. For example, int health, then a char pointer name. Um, it might have load of stamina and yeah let's say that's it for the moment then we need to specify the struct keyword also here and now we do have a player defined here and we can then assign it a name one health let's say 100 and let's say our stamina is also 100 yep like that one other thing that I wanted to mention is right now we have only um, allocated space on the stack um, to store values but for larger uh, values that uh, often also for values that are dynamic in size um, we also can store or allocate space on the heap which is basically slower but is more fitted for large and um, things that are dynamic in size but um, for, for personal from personal preferences I can say that you should um, use it only when very needed yeah because it doesn't have too much yeah it does have a lot of downsides um, let's say for example speed and also you need to clean up um, after yourself so but let's say we want to allocate a player on the heap then we would specify a player pointer and then we can use malloc to allocate space on the heap and then we have to specify how much space you want to allocate like this and as we can see we can't use the dot notation then anymore we could either use um, the star right here like this but this looks ugly the same thing can be achieved with this um, arrow and this is how you usually write it Um, what you need to do is after you've you're done using the thing you have allocated let's say we create a custom scope right here let's say you're done using the player then you also need to free it again because otherwise it would lead to memory leaks oh, of course we also need to include um, the functions and they are part of stdlib um, now we can use them If I would have saved it. Like this. And our program should work as expected. We could then go ahead and do something with our player, but this should just this video should have just been a small overview of 
um, all the essentials in C. And I think we have that covered now. Any other thing specific I will cover in the following videos. And yeah, thank you very much for watching and I hope this has been helpful and see you next time.